You learn something new every day, so the old saying goes. But do we? Do we learn something new every day? Perhaps it would be truer to say there's something to learn every day. And because we believe in a God who can speak to us personally, we can ask, what is God teaching me today? Abraham. Abraham is the man chosen by God on which to build a nation, a nation for himself. Not because Abraham's good, no. Not because he's deserving, but simply because it would display God's goodness and his grace and display God's glory. Now, Abraham's nephew Lot was originally part of Abraham's travelling household, but he chose to leave. Now, Lot made a lot of wrong choices. He ended up with his home and his possessions destroyed, his wife condemned instantly to death, and his daughters using him in the most disgusting way that we saw last week. And apart from Lot being referred to in the New Testament a few times, that's the last we hear of him. But Abraham, Abraham, he has plenty to do and plenty to learn. We're reading here in Genesis 20, verse 1. Now Abraham moved on from there into the region of the Negev and lived between Kadesh and Shur. And for a while he stayed in Gerar. And there Abraham said of his wife, Sarah, she is my sister. And then Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent for Sarah and took her. So it's, he really moved south and towards a coastal plain. So probably a sensible place to be. So it looks, sounds a good place to be, probably well watered. And like the word Pharaoh, Abimelech is actually a title, a royal title, like a king. It's not actually a name. Now, he's not as powerful as Pharaoh, but Abraham, as we can see from today's chapter today's reading he's still afraid of him now Abraham presumed Abimelech was completely godless and that he would have to tell a lie this partial truth to protect himself and his family and you might be asking hang on isn't this the man of God isn't this the man who's had these huge blessings heaped on him he's had God appear to him Uh, just him singling him out from all people he's the chosen one And you think, well, doesn't he believe that God will protect him and his family? There are some trust issues here, aren't there? And still in verse 2 of chapter 20, it says, Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent for Sarah and took her. Now remember, how old is Sarah at this point? She's 90 years old. And you're thinking, why would a woman of 90 be taken by Abimelech? as effectively one of his wives. Now this account, admittedly, doesn't mention her beauty, like other accounts before it. But perhaps, perhaps there are physical changes that were taking place in her body to prepare her for pregnancy. This might have made her appear a little younger and a little healthier. The next thing we read is this, verse 3. But God came to Abimelech in a dream one night and said... You are as good as dead because of the woman you've taken. She is a married woman. Now, this is some intervention, isn't it? Now, we see in the scriptures the Lord appearing to Joseph, husband of Mary, in several dreams, you know, in the Christmas story, it's dream after dream, where he's told and warned not to do this and change his route. But Joseph's a, a godly man, isn't he? Abimelech? Well, he's someone who doesn't consider himself to be the Lord's. And yet the Lord is appearing to him. It's a crucial intervention. God steps in to protect this fragile family. This family in the making, if you like. This nation in the making. A fledgling nation. And my mind's drawn to Isaiah 42. Isaiah 42. And this is talking of, of Jesus doesn't mention his name it's called the servant servant of the lord 
And there in verse 3 of Isaiah 42, it says that a bruised reed he will not break, and a smouldering wick he will not snuff out. We think about Jesus in his ministry. He was often very gentle, wasn't he, with those who were needy, who were vulnerable, and and they knew their need. And here, really, we have a similar kind of situation in that God deals with people gently. doesn't always, uh, we might think of him coming in a thunderous form, but no, he can come gently sometimes. And he's protecting this, this nation to be through Abraham. You are as good as dead, he tells Abimelech. Because of the woman you've taken. She's a married woman. And uh, even though we consider him to be not a God-fearing man, in their culture... It was a very, very serious thing to take a married woman uh, and and treat her as if she were your own. And so he pleads his innocence. Look at this, verse 4. Now Abimelech had not gone near her, so he said, Lord, will you destroy an innocent nation? Did he not say to me, she is my sister? And didn't she also say, he is my brother? I've done this with a clear conscience and clean hands. He's pleading his innocence. Well, God says to him in reply, verse 6, again in the dream, Yes, I know you did this with a clear conscience. And so I have kept you from sinning against me. And that is why I did not let you touch her. He's intervened. Now return, verse 7, Return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, And he will pray for you and you will live. But if you do not return her, you may be sure that you and all yours will die. Well, yes, that's in a dream. But Abimelech takes this really seriously, utterly seriously. How do we know that? What do we read in verse 8? Early the next morning, early, he doesn't have a lie in. Early the next morning, Abimelech summoned all his officials Because all the people around him, he's not expecting them to say, you crazy fool. He's expecting to be be believed. And so he's early next morning, he's right on it. He tells all his officials, he told them all that had happened. They were very much afraid. So they take it seriously as well, even though it's come in the form of a dream. Verse 9. Then Abimelech called Abraham in and said, What have you done to us? How have I wronged you that you have brought such great guilt upon me and my kingdom? You have done things to me that should not be done. And Abimelech asked Abraham, What was your reason for doing this? And you can see this is deep. This is really deeply hurting Abimelech. And he actually appears more bothered by it than Abraham is. Which again is a shocking situation. Showing how blasé and out of step with God Abraham had actually become. You know, our our hero, our man of God, isn't doing so well now, is he? Verse 11 gives us Abraham's reply. Verse 11. I said to myself, Abraham replied, there is surely no fear of God in this place and they will kill me because of my wife. Besides, she really is my sister, the daughter of my father, though not of my mother, and she became my wife. And when God caused me to wander from my father's household, I said to her, this is how you can show your love to me. Everywhere we go, say of me, he is my brother. Do you see that phrase there? There is surely no fear of God in this place. You might feel like saying, listen to yourself, Abraham. Listen, you could be well speaking of your own heart at this this point. There's no fear of God in your own heart, Abraham. Not true true fear, not true respect, not true honour. We might be thinking, 
Who does he think he is to say such things? Can't he see his own hypocrisy? Probably not. You know, we often have a special category for ourselves. We give ourselves more grace than we give to others. Oh, that's different, we say, and we we excuse our behaviour. And I can tell you, pride and entitlement, they easily creep into our lives once we're walking with the Lord Jesus. We become Christians, and sometimes we think we're we're immune, or we can just uh, be excused for many different things. But we have to continue to look out for this pride and entitlement that can easily creep in. And we must rid ourselves of it. We must bring it to God and confess it. And then know his forgiveness. And know the humility and the leaning on the Lord that needs to replace that feeling entitled. Now, we might be known as Christians, as God's people, and yet behave independently, drifting off into selfish or fear led behaviour. I think that's where Abraham is at this point, where we meet him in Genesis 20. Look at verse 13. This is, this is the blame game. And when God calls me to wander from my father's household, so that's talking about him way back in, in chapter 12, where he's leaving that civilised place, the height of civilization, Ur of the Chaldees. He leaves there to live in a tent. And he says, when God caused me to wander, And this really sounds like Abraham's actually trying to use the Lord God as part of the excuse, blaming God for this regular cover-up. And now just because Abraham made an agreement with Sarah doesn't make it right. It doesn't justify him at all. We're probably thinking, I don't know if you've been with us through this series in in, uh, Genesis so far, but you might be thinking, hang on, isn't this a bit of deja vu? Didn't he do this earlier? Didn't he do this before when he was in Egypt? And yes, you're absolutely right. Abraham is a repeat offender. It's happening all over again. Uh, some people, of course, um, will doubt the Bible. And they'll say, oh, well, they've just made a mistake and thrown a few new names in. It's the same story repeated. But I don't believe that for a minute. Because the people who say that don't know human nature. They don't know themselves. How many times have you done the wrong thing? And then done the wrong thing again. And then done the wrong thing again. Well, Abraham's just like us. And just like everyone. We repeat our mistakes, don't we? So Abraham, yes, he's a repeat offender. And I'll say, aren't we the same? Aren't we the same? Oftentimes we repeat our mistakes. And we might ask, why? Because we're slow to learn. Perhaps because we just accept ourselves as we are. We expect to make the same mistakes again and again. And we expect to be forgiven by everyone else and we trot out the modern mantra I'm only human after all but that is very very different isn't it to what is God teaching me today many years ago uh, my youth leader uh, he spoke about a, a horse riding event that he saw my youth leader was a, a mature man he wasn't he wasn't a, he wasn't a kid um, guess at the time he was probably late 40s early 50s but he spoke about this horse riding event that he saw in a a gymkhana and the horse and the rider they had to jump every fence and obstacle and if the horse and rider failed the jump they'd have to go all the way around again until that challenge was completed and my youth leader said that that is how life with the lord is that there are several lessons that the Lord is going to teach us in our lives and he will bring us to learn them until we have learnt that lesson. That the Lord takes us on similar challenges and perhaps they could be months or even years apart. And so that his plans for us are fulfilled, he'll take us round that way again so that we learn, so that we bring him glory and that his plans are fulfilled. And I believe this is what was happening here in the life of Abraham. Today's lessons are preparation 
for tomorrow's challenges. God's purposes are fulfilled in people who've been trained and taught by him. It's not become a Christian, job done. It's just the start, isn't it? He wants to work in us his sovereign will, that we become the people that he wants us to be. And that is through teaching and training all the way through our lives. I often tell this uh, to young people and say maturity isn't a sudden, immediate, explosive occurrence. It's not a one-off happening. You don't say, wake up when you're 18 or wake up when you're 21. Oh, I'm an adult. And suddenly have adult tastes and uh, adult behaviour. And you're suddenly all sensible. No, it's a build-up of things day after day after day. You become the person that you're going to be. And maturity isn't a sudden, immediate, explosive occurrence, but one that takes all the time that God requires for us to go through it. Genesis 20, verse 14. Then Abimelech brought sheep and cattle and male and female slaves and gave them to Abraham. And he returned Sarah, his wife, to him. And Abimelech said, my land is before you. Live wherever you like. Wow! How generous Abimelech is. All well, these gifts, he doesn't have to do this. Uh, my thought is how embarrassing to see the godless shame the ones called God's people with their kindness and their forgiveness, their hospitality. And it goes on, verse 16, to Sarah, he said, I'm giving your brother a thousand shekels of silver. This is to cover the offence against you before all who are with you. You are completely vindicated. Again, it's incredible generosity from the man who himself has been wronged. He just wouldn't expect it, would we? You're completely vindicated, he tells Sarah. And Abimelech knows that after this, no blame can be put on at his door. He's going out of his way to clear his name out of his way to make sure he causes no offence and to be open-hearted, honest and generous. He knows that Abraham and Sarah tried to trick him. Now, you might have noticed this, you might have picked up on this. In verse 16, to Sarah he says, I'm giving your brother a thousand shekels of silver. And Abimelech's being ironic there. He's being ironic because, yes, there might be a, a half-brother thing there, but he's, he's having a little go at them, really. Our last two verses say this, verse 17 and 18. Then Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abimelech, his wife and his slave girls, so that he could have children again. For the Lord had closed up every womb in Abimelech's household, Because of Abraham's wife, Sarah. The Lord shows he's powerful. The Lord shows that he is the God who can and does answer prayer. And that he has the power not only to make our bodies in the first place. You know, we're back in uh, Genesis 1, verse 26. We have the famous verse of him making man, mankind. He has the power to do that, breathe his life into us. He has the power not only to make our bodies in the first place, but to intervene and cause things to happen or not happen within our bodies to fulfil our purposes. What is God teaching me today? God is teaching, but are we listening? God is teaching. But are we actually changing our thinking, our attitudes, our behaviour? Abraham, though he had failed to act in faith yet again, was still God's chosen man. Don't don't miss this point. You might think, oh, he's jettisoned it. He's thrown it all away. He won't be given another chance. Again, we see this in the Apostle Peter. We think he's blown it after he denies Christ. After the resurrection, though. Jesus reinstates him. He says, you're still the man. I'm still going to work through you. You're still going to be the pastor. 
You're going to be the one leading the flock. And here is Abraham still there as God's chosen man, still the one blessed with God's covenant promises. Those promises still hold true. God has stepped in so that they would come to fruition. They will take place. And Abraham here, in verse 17, he still has the role of mediating, praying to the Lord on Abimelech's behalf, that the curse of childliness, childlessness uh, be taken away and God's blessing of the gift of life replace it. And think about it. Abraham's selfishness and his faithlessness nearly wrecked his, his own life and the whole future of the Jewish nation. But of course, the Lord stepped in. He's not going to let that happen. His plans will be accomplished. And making it personal, when we make a mess of things, when we get it wrong, when we walk out of the Lord's ways, when we, walk, we take a step off the narrow way, and we disappoint ourselves, we disappoint others around us, we're still God's people. We're still God's people. We're still receiving his blessings. And we're still responsible for praying for others who don't yet know him. I have known it in the past where people um, have actually been in a, in a state a bit like this that Abraham's in, uh, not really truly walking with the Lord. And then some non-Christian has actually asked them about their faith. And they've been pulled up short. Um, and they thought, well, actually, I haven't really been the person I should be. I haven't really been walking with him as I should have been. And sometimes God uses those situations to cause us to think again of how we are really walking, how we are to be bearing his name all the time and, and, and living it out, living out his purposes not living selfishly, not wandering off. Brothers and sisters, we have not always represented the Lord of heaven as we should. I think if we're being honest, that's true, isn't it? Yeah. We don't live perfect lives, do we? We haven't always represented God in the way that we should. And we need to learn from Abraham and Sarah... Not to tell half-truths, to deceive, that's what they were doing. And they were also resorting to an old lie, an old habit. They said, well, we made, this, we made this decision. Well, we don't have to stick to it. If you made a mistake in the past, you don't have to stick to it, do you? You should be growing. As aged as, aged as they are, we can still learn. We can keep learning till the day we die, can't we? We shouldn't be telling half-truth to deceive. And we shouldn't be fearing people. Going back to our opening verse in Colossians 3. Do not lie to one another, Paul says. You've taken off your old self. That's the way of Satan, to tell lies, to deceive, to make ourselves look better. What do we need to be doing? We need to be displaying the Lord in his truth. So we need to hold on confidently to God's promises. Abraham had been given those most directly by God himself. We have them through the Bible, don't we, today? And by claiming these promises by faith in the Lord, he comes to us. And we need to walk in his truth. He is the one we live to please. And just as it says in Ephesians 2 verse 10, we are God's workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. He will equip us with what we need to do his will. That's good, isn't it? No matter who you are, you might think, I'm not that special. I'm a bit ordinary. God's given you gifts. He's given you the opportunities to use them. And the energy and whatever else that's needed to use them. He will equip you to do his will. Be assured of that. And as you hear this, perhaps you're still on the outside, as it were, looking in. You haven't yet surrendered your will to the Lord. You haven't yet been convicted that you're a sinner 
in need of Christ's rescue. And to you I say, consider the claims of Jesus seriously, carefully. Read one of the Gospels for yourself. And then ask, what is God teaching me today? Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you that this history recorded here from the life of Abraham is here. That it's not blotted out. It's not, oh, get rid of that, because it doesn't look too good for the man of God. We thank you that it's included here with all his excuses, the half-truths. We thank you that we see you stepping in, making sure that your plan would succeed. Lord, we thank you that this shows us that you are a God of action and power. You are a God who gives us responsibilities and opportunities. And we pray, Lord, that we would take these opportunities that you give to us in our lives. Help us to come clean. Help us to be honest when we do fail, both to each other, but particularly to you. And Lord, to, to know something from what's happened, to realise our, our nature, our, our weaknesses, where we go wrong, where we're susceptible. Lord, strengthen us there. Help us to keep learning. Help us to have an appetite to learn that we become more and more like the Lord Jesus for your glory. And we pray for those who do not yet know you, that they would be convicted of their own sin and their responsibility before you. Lord, you have the power to change. We pray that many more would be brought into your family to know your will and purposes for them. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.